Good morning. Good morning, good morning. I'm really glad you guys can join us today. Yes, I am Jason. That is my name, and I am glad that you can join us this morning. Uh, I'm really excited about this morning. I'm really excited about this season that we're heading into. Karen mentioned the Lifelinks Conference uh, in Winnipeg. That is always a highlight of the year for me. It's one of the the two main highlights of the year for me uh, as far as the pastoral side of things go. Uh, Just joining with other amazing pastors and churches who are part of our same church family from not just across Canada, but across the whole world. So a lot of the people that I meet in Uganda when I've gone the last two years, they're going to be coming out. People from England, people from uh, all over the world. Now I've gone and started listing countries and I don't know them all. It's terrible. Uh, but it's going to be great to be able to see them all in Winnipeg. And it's, it's, it's hosted. Our main central conference is hosted in Winnipeg. So you guys can come out and join and that, that's just fantastic. Uh, but I have set for myself this morning a really simple task. I would like to unravel the deep mysteries of the prophetic and the speaking of the Holy Spirit to all of us. I will obviously, obviously, this will not be a completely inclusive, total start to finish when you leave this morning. We'll all understand everything morning. I want to do a broad overview, you know, the 30,000 foot flyover overview of the prophetic. Because when a person says prophecy or prophet, We all come with strong connotations, with strong understandings, impulses, ideas about the word. Maybe for some of you it conjures up a a daytime talk show TV host psychic. Mm, I I see the letters M, R, and Q and the color green. Does that mean anything to you? Oh, yes. Oh, of course. And, And on it goes. Or maybe it conjures up this image of a of a grizzled old man with a staff yelling at you. God said he will smite you for your wrath, and I'm mad about everything. Maybe that's what you you conjured up. Or maybe it's some, you know, quirky person you met along the years who said, thus saith the Lord. It's my mom again. She pops up these messages a lot. She's never said, thus saith the Lord, but it's it's fun to imagine what that would sound like. So we're going to unpack some of this a little bit, and I'm calling this message Demystifying the Prophetic, bringing this down into the level that the Bible talks about, unpacking what the Bible actually says. Now remember, this is a refresher course. If you're a believer, then the Bible is our rock-bottom foundation for all of our beliefs. So you might have personal beliefs that are different. That's fine. I'm not arguing with you about your personal beliefs. We're going to unpack what the Bible itself says because we're a Bible church and we like to unpack and look at things through the lens of the Bible. So what is prophecy? If it's not weird, hocus pocus, fringy, whatever, something, or, you know, telling the future, what is prophecy? Put quite simple, and this is a a human definition, but if you look at what the Bible talks about prophecy, at its rock bottom, it's hearing God for someone else. Hearing the Holy Spirit, understanding, hearing is in quotation marks because it might not be like some audible voice, but hearing and understanding the Holy Spirit for someone else. Now, before we unpack that, I'm actually going to start really ABC, and I'm going to ask the question, can we hear God? Does the Holy Spirit speak to us? And the short answer is, yeah, biblically speaking, Uh, Time and time and time and time and time again, the Holy Spirit wants to speak to you. See, God wants to have a relationship. This isn't um, uh, contra the Bible. This isn't against the Bible or adding words to the Bible. This is the Holy Spirit. This is God wanting to have an actual relationship with you, right? If you're a parent, you might give your kid a book. But actually, I, I, don't, I don't know how you guys are, but for me, half the fun of seeing Hannah get a book is that I get to read her the book. I get to have that relationship with her, still tuck her in at night and all the rest. I don't just go, here's your book for Christmas, Hannah, go read it now. I, I want to have that relationship with her, and it's, it's similar with God. And in fact, again, biblically, right, because we're going to go back to the Bible, uh, God speaks to all sorts of us. You want to throw up that next slide there? He speaks to Christians, John 14, 26. Non-Christians, John 16, 8. He speaks to individuals, to groups. He speaks when you've done right. He speaks in conviction when you've done wrong. 
and he speaks to everyone. Now, I've thrown up those verses there, and, and the reality is I'm not going to read through all of them. This is for your extra research. If you want to know what I'm talking about, what the Bible talks about, this will be up online on YouTube. Maybe you're listening to it on YouTube right now. That's great. This is for you to do some extra research. I'm just going to pick out really quickly two of those verses, uh, Hebrews 3, verses 7 and 8. The author of Hebrews says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness. So look, listen. If you hear God's voice, listen. If you hear God's voice, pay attention. The Holy Spirit wants to speak to you. When you hear it, don't harden your heart. If we want to go down further, if we're talking a little bit more about the prophetic, in Joel, uh, in the Old Testament, in Joel... Uh, chapter 2, verses 28 and 29. The prophet Joel said this. He says, after this, talking about the church age and the New Testament age, which, by the way, you're all living in, so right now is after this, I will pour out my spirit on all humanity. Are you human? Some of you are very slow to nod your heads. Are you human? Okay, so we're part of all humanity. So God says, I will pour out my spirit on you. We sometimes say all humanity in some vague abstract, but I think we smuggle in our head the idea that like maybe some special chosen people for somewhere else or whatever, but certainly not me. Goodness, not me. All. You're part of all humanity. Then your sons and your daughters will prophesy, your old men will have dreams, and your young men will see visions. And I will even pour out my spirit on the male and the female slaves in those days. So if you're male, female, or young, or old, which is all of us, then God wants to pour his spirit out. He wants to speak to you. And this is a whole message for another day. How can you learn to hear God speak and all the rest? All I'm trying to establish now is he does. The Holy Spirit wants to speak to you. He wants to actually have a relationship with you and talk to you and hear you. Prayer isn't only just one-sided. Dear Jesus, please help me to have a better day and to sleep well at night and for my car to magically fix itself. Amen. He wants to talk to you. He wants to have a back and forth. So yeah. Spirit speaks to you. Number two, does the Bible, our rock bottom foundational reference for everything, talk about prophecy and or encourage prophecy? Again, thanks for asking. Great question. Let me unpack that. Uh, Yes. And I'm just cherry picking here a little bit. The Bible is just rife full of God saying, I want to talk to my children. But I'm going to cherry pick just one scripture here. 2 Peter 1 verse 19. Peter says this. He says, so we have, we, that's by the way, plural for you and me. We have the prophetic word. And not just the prophetic word, the prophetic word strongly confirmed. And in fact, not just do we have it, and not just is it strongly confirmed, you will do well to pay attention. So we have the prophetic word. It gets strongly confirmed, and you would do well to pay attention to it. As to a lamp shining in a dismal place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. So yes, we are told we have the prophetic word. God speak to us. God speaks to us for other people. And that's what the Bible talks about. So then I want to get a little bit deeper into this. Let's, let's, let's go one level down. What is this for? What is this about? What is this hocus pocus about? It, it, is this about, uh, um, I think a lot of us, I think a lot of people, especially if you're Mennonite, you've read the prophets primarily in the, in the Old Testament, and what you're seeing is a lot of anger and wrath, and, and it seems kind of harsh. Is that what this is about? Is it about judgment? Is this about like reading your mail? You know, mm, in public I shall pronounce your secret sin, and I will shame you, or you know, something like that. And, and at rock bottom, no. None of that is what the prophetic is about. The prophetic is really simple. We're going to demystify it this morning. At its core, the prophetic is about building up, stirring up, and cheering up those around you. Building up, stirring up, and cheering up those around you. The words that are used mostly in the Bible are edify, exhort, and encourage, which is a nice little acrostic like the three E's, edify, exhort, and encourage. But we don't use edify and exhort a ton in English, so I prefer build up, stir up, and cheer up. They mean the same thing. What they mean is, I mean, I think we all know it is to build someone up. You know, this is how God sees you and, and God cares about you and he notices you and, and I want to speak this, often it's a scripture verse, right? I want to speak this scripture verse to you and it builds the person up. It, it builds up their life and their confidence. And to exhort or to stir up 
It means exactly that. When you stir someone up, rise, be strong, be brave. God says again and again to people in trouble, be strong and courageous for I will give you the victory. Again and again we read that in the Bible. What's God saying? I know this will end well for you, so be brave. That's prophetic. That's stirring up. Cheering up or encouraging, of course we know that. You know, you really see you're, you're down right now, and I see you're down, and I just really think that what God would say to you is that, uh, is that he cares about you and he knows you. In fact, what, what Kim was talking about just a little few minutes ago, about how I really feel like there's some of you right now who can't really receive this understanding that God really loves you, and then she went in to unpack that. That, that right there is encouragement, right? It's cheering up. So, how do I know this? Again, we go back to scriptures, right? We can go on to 1 Corinthians 14, 3, verse, or 3 to 5. Again, I'm cruising through all of this stuff. All of my notes and these messages will all be up online. You can kind of go and unpack this deeper. And if you have any questions, awesome. We actually have a whole course coming this Saturday, right? So if you want to sign up, 10 bucks. If you can't afford it, come talk to us. We want you there. We're actually going to be unpacking this even further and bringing in an expert on this to talk about it further. So come this Saturday. 1 Corinthians 14. Paul says, But the person who prophesies speaks to people for edification, encouragement, and consolation. But now you want to translate it. There's your build up, stir up, and cheer up. The person who speaks in another language, he's talking about speaking in tongues, builds himself up, right? Because you don't understand what I'm saying if I speak in tongues. But the one who prophesies builds up the church. Build up, cheer up, stir up. He says, I wish you all spoke in other languages, but even more that you prophesied. So Paul, the great apostle that everybody loves to quote, says, look, I wish you all prophesied. And yet there's an epidemic in the church these days of people going, ooh, that seems scary and hocus pocus and I don't want to do that. I understand that I have full sympathies. All I'm saying is I actually don't want to govern my own life and as a church, we don't want to govern our church life by just how we feel. We want to actually go to the scriptures and build a church and build our lives and build a discipleship around what the Bible says. And the Bible says, I wish you would all prophesy. It's good. You would do well to follow the strongly confirmed prophetic word again and again. Whew. We're making it through a lot of material here. We're going to keep on clipping along. Um. So why is there this Old Testament strongly uh, anger word, and is that how prophecy still functions today? Cleverly timed sip of water to build suspense. I'm also losing my voice. Uh, the really short version, and again, I am just cruising over this a little bit to give some context. Uh, no, that's actually not how the prophetic works in the New Testament. See, in the Old Testament, God had not poured out his spirit on all people. They were living in the Old Testament covenant before Jesus came and reconciled man to God and before the Holy Spirit was poured out on all people. And so when God would send a, a prophet in the Old Testament, and actually just as a side note, they're far less depressing and angry than you think. If you actually read through, whether it be Ezekiel or the works of Isaiah or um, um, Jeremiah, they're actually strongly encouraging when the day is done. But what they were sent for primarily at that time was God would put his words directly in the mouth of an individual to confront a wayward people, a hard-hearted people. When the Israelites had done wrong and, or were rebelling against God's appointed kings or God's appointed judge, judges, and they were not following his word, God would send a prophet now and again to guide them back onto the right path. And so that was the role of the prophet in the Old Testament. And there's a whole bunch of stuff and a bunch of reasoning I don't have time to get all into, but in the New Testament, we live in a different age where God's poured his spirit on all believers, so you have the Holy Spirit in you. So you are not, or at least you should not be, in rebellion against God. And so God's not sending the prophetic word to correct and rebuke and shame and filled with anger. God wants to have a relationship with you. And proof of that, proof of his desire, is he's given you an impartation of his Holy Spirit in you as a seal of his covenant. And so this is brothers and sisters. Shared. This isn't God's appointed voice piece of anger against the wayward people. This is brothers and sisters, equals before God and children of God. And so this is for building up and stirring up and cheering up, supporting each other, caring for each other. This is a really good thing, which is why Paul says, I wish you would all prophesy. Not so that you look like a bunch of angry kooks, 
but so that we can be built up and stirred up and cheered up. Amen? Isn't that good? Amen? There we go. We're awake. Got you again. Almost lost you. So how does, how does the, prophetic, the prophetic actually accomplish any of this? Well, there's a couple of different flavors and the way things can look, a couple of different pieces of it. And there's different ways you can kind of break it up or pull it apart. But I just want to touch on one this morning, which I think might be helpful to unpack or understand what you're witnessing or what you're experiencing as we move forward in learning to hear God. So uh, we're going to unpack from 1 Corinthians 12, uh, verses 7 to 8, when Paul's talking about how the prophetic can look and how the gifts of the Spirit can look. And he says, a demonstration of the Spirit, a demonstration of the Spirit is given to each person. Are you a person? Woo! We're all awake. Each person. That means a demonstration of the Holy Spirit has been given to you. And how does that look? What does that mean? Well, it's to produce what is beneficial. What are some of the things that are beneficial? Well, a partial list is to one is given a message of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, a message of knowledge by the same Spirit. So we build up, stir up, and cheer up through messages of wisdom and knowledge. Sometimes that's uh, uh, broken down different ways, words of knowledge and words of wisdom, or sometimes it's broken out to be um, uh, revelation, interpretation, and application. So it's, saying it's, it's revelation is, this is what's happening. This is when somebody has an insight into a situation that they couldn't possibly know, right? Um, and, it's, and I'll give you an example from the Bible in just a couple of seconds. Uh, but this is really powerful. And I'll give you some examples from my own life in a minute. In fact, um, this is really amazing. I'm going I'm to break down a little simple example of, of where the knowledge and the wisdom and the application kind of came. They often come separately, not necessarily from one person. Uh, years ago, when I had just started as, uh, on the church as a pastor, this would be seven and a half years ago or something like that, then I was in a prophetic course. And so we were each supposed to just write stuff down, and then we got partnered up in prayer, and we shared what we had written down. And so this person who got partnered with me was just super embarrassed. She looked like she wanted to just die. She didn't want to share what she had written down. But you had to. That was kind of part of the course. And so here's what she wrote down. She said, this is going to sound so stupid, and I'm sorry, and I think I messed this up. And she went on and on and on. I said, just, just, what did you write? Here's what she'd written. She said, um, something about a, about a change, and I, and I saw it maybe a little awkward, but then, and then she got, got embarrassed. She almost choked out. And I said, no, 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 you have to go, you have to go. And she said, well, I saw a pair of brown suede shoes, and you ran really well. Now, what she could not possibly have known is, when I was 19, I bought a pair of shoes, a pair of brown suede Puma runners, and they were my favorite shoes I've ever worn. I rant and I talk about them. I've tried to buy those shoes, but of course, shoemakers, they don't make the same shoe again, and you can't buy those anymore, and they're gone. And I wore them for years and years and years till they just finally fell apart, and I had never worn a shoe that fit that well in my whole life. And I've actually honestly looked on these like, like um, old shoe websites where people like buy shoes and they store them for years to sell them at a markup. You can't buy those brown suede Pumas and they were the best. And what she was saying is you had a change in your job and it's, it's weird, but don't worry. It'll be like brown suede shoes. Freaked her right out. Well, to me, it makes perfect sense. See, there's no way that some random stranger could know that once upon a time, I had a pair of brown suede runners. There's no way. See, that's a word of knowledge. God, the Holy Spirit, granted her some understanding of my life that she could not possibly have. A word of knowledge. And the word of wisdom, which is separate from that, was, and so will your new career also fit you. See, that's an understanding. That's a piece of wisdom. Now, the application's up to me. Because a good prophetic word leaves you with the chance to receive it or not and to figure out what you want to do. A bad prophetic word would be, now you must do this and this and this and go here and do that, because that can become kind of controlling, manipulative. And in, in the context of the church, amongst believers, brothers and sisters, we are open-handed with our prophetic. We want to encourage and build up and cheer up, right? Not control and manipulate. She couldn't have known that. Now, we see this actually strongly confirmed in the Bible, this idea of revelation, interpretation, and application. If you want to turn with me to John chapter 4. 
It'll also be up there, but the gist of it is, Jesus is going through, uh, going through his ministry, and he comes to a well, and a Samaritan woman is at the well. And the Jews and the Samaritans, of course, hated each other because the Jews were half Gentile, or the Samaritans were half Gentile, half Jew, and they were hybrids, and everybody was mad at each other. And, and Jesus strikes up this conversation with her and has this amazing conversation. And he says, actually, you know what? You don't just need water. You need living water. And Jesus says that he's the living water. And this woman is very curious and interested she wants this. And she says, can I have some of this? And Jesus says, go get your husband and then come back here. And we're going to pick this up in verse 17. The woman says, I don't have a husband, she answered. And Jesus says, you have correctly said, I don't have a husband. For you've had five husbands. And the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. That's a word of knowledge. Apart from the Holy Spirit, no person can know the marriage history of a woman by talking to her for 30 seconds about water. Am I correct? This is a word of knowledge. But what do you do with it? That's the word of wisdom, which will come in a second. Sir, the woman replied, I see that you are a prophet. This is the, uh, yeah, light bulb moment. He just said, you've had five husbands and the man you're with is not your husband. Oh, I see you're a prophet. Yes, Captain Obvious has struck again, of course. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, yet you Jews say that the place to worship is in Jerusalem. And Jesus told her, believe me, woman, an hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know, but we worship what we do know, because salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and is now here, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. Yes, the Father wants such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. And the woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. And when he comes, he will explain everything to us. I am he, Jesus told her, the one speaking to you. The word of knowledge was about her marriage situation. The word of wisdom is that Jesus Christ himself is the Messiah. You see, Jesus shares with her a piece of knowledge and the wisdom leads her to understand that he's the risen true savior. Now moving on, it says, just then his disciples arrived and they were amazed that he was talking with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? And then the woman left her water jar, went into town and told the men, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? See, this woman has a prophetic meeting with Jesus, has a word of knowledge shown to her, has a word of revelation revealed to her, and the application is she becomes the very first evangelist to the Gentiles. She moves out of the Jews and begins to evangelize. I think I have found the Messiah and begins to preach. And this woman who's had this messy past has this transformation. And it comes through a very simple building up, cheering up, and stirring up of the prophetic. And that's the power of prophecy. To speak an existing truth with a new power. There are many ways you can say, Hey, woman, you've had five husbands and the man you're with is not your husband that are filled with judgment and condemnation and anger. The power of the prophetic is because it's spirit to spirit. It's God's spirit in you speaking to God's spirit in someone else. Is you can speak these truths in love and bring healing and reconciliation. Say, you know what? But the Messiah is here, the one who forgives sins. And instead of receiving it as a, as a horrible rebuke and condemnation, the woman received it as a revelation of the Messiah and received it with joy. And that's the power. We hear God and we speak his life, not our words, his life over someone else. And it encourages and edifies and exhorts. And the person receives an encounter with the Holy Spirit. So, I've answered all of your questions, and we have nothing more to go over, and we're going to move on. Nervous chuckles. No, I want to stop actually just and address one or two questions that uh, I'm sure some of you will be having. This is not exhaustive. And um, in fact, if you have questions after this, or if you come to the course on Saturday and you still have questions, what I would encourage you to do, email, text, Facebook, whatever, Instagram, me, Karen, Florence, The Open Door, we're all available, write in letters, call. Give us your questions. I would love to spend some time unpacking this. I would love to talk to you about it. If this freaks you out, if this makes you excited but confused or whatever, 
Let's walk this journey together because this is strongly talked about in the Bible. And so let's unpack this in a journey together. Amen? First question. Why might God speak to someone else instead of to you? Good question, right? If you have the Holy Spirit in you, why might God speak to someone else prophetically rather than just to you? This is, not, again, not exhaustive, but I just want to give you a sense or a flavor of some of the reasons that we've seen in the Bible and some of the things I've experienced in my life, why God might speak to someone else. Uh, first off, I want to say why he doesn't. It's not to embarrass you. It's not to reveal your dirty laundry. It's always about love and care, safety, compassion, and a relationship with God, right? Build up, stir up, cheer up. So, uh, well, one reason might be you're just not listening. You and me, we, we don't listen. Or we're listening for the wrong thing, right? I, I, I see people, people want uh, um, to pray for worry, and God actually wants to speak to them about forgiveness. Or maybe you're just busy with your job, and God wants to talk to you about some base underlying assumption. So we're not listening, or we're not listening to the right thing. And sometimes God just speaks to someone else who's tuning in and maybe listening for that thing, and that person could just come along, put their arm around you, and just help you out a little bit which is really quite beautiful because we're all a body of believers together. Amen? So maybe you're not listening. Or what God wants to speak to you might involve other people or might be um, something that's sizable enough that he wants other people involved in your life. Maybe the revelation he has for you is a little hard or painful. Or maybe it just requires outside help. Maybe it's not that big a thing, but requires outside help. And so then God, even in the revelation, brings somebody else alongside you, right? And naturally puts a trusted person in your life, even as God's opening up some issue he wants to talk to you about. Another reason, uh, God might want to just involve other people, strengthen the whole body. Rather than just being you and him back and forth, you become part of a bigger body as God gives some revelations to some people and some to other people and you come together and when you all bring your offerings together, it becomes something beautiful. That's another reason, right? It's, it's like a potluck supper. Right? You each bring your own things and together you have a big meal. Sometimes God just wants to naturally knit his people together. It also stops people from feeling like they have what's sometimes called the hotline to heaven. I pray to God and he speaks to me immediately and I'm God's special chosen person. And sometimes he just says, you know what? Actually, I want to bring other people involved in this. It's not just you and me. It's us together, right? It's this whole unity thing. A really big one, often just to help confirm a word you already feel, you already know, and just to guard you from doubt. Sometimes we know what God's saying to us, but it's hard or it's big or it's scary or we doubt ourselves. And he just wants to involve other people. Just as confirmation. That's a really big one. In, in most of our lives, right? You're not the only one who feels a certain way. Here's a really big one. To be a demonstration to doubters or non-believers. Talks about this in the Bible a lot. I encourage you to do some research on this. But that actually the prophetic, when, when, when new believers or non-believers come around and they see God speaking to other people in accurate ways, that actually boosts the faith of doubters and non-believers, and last one, I just picked a short list here. There's lots I could get into um, because you're in danger of misunderstanding or misapplying something. I think sometimes we wait too long for like 35 different kinds of confirmations on things and God just says, you know what? If, if what you're doing is full of love and you're really trying and trusting me, just run with it. But you know, we, we can get down blind alleys or wrong roads and you know, God's faithful. And when we start doing that, he just sends people along to just guide us back to that path. And so sometimes we just need a little nudging or a little guiding back to that path because we're, we got blind spots and sometimes it's just nice to have other people speak into our lives. A couple of reasons why God might speak to someone else prophetically rather than just directly to you. Uh, another question. Is all of this stuff hocus pocus about the future? No, primarily not actually. Sometimes it's relevant to the future, but no, this isn't about future telling. This is more about forth telling than future telling. What's forth telling? Well, it's quite simple. Uh, the woman at the well was in, an, in a situation, right? She had five husbands before and the man she's with, not her husband. And God, and Jesus just came and, and he spoke the current truth. He spoke her current truth over her, but then he spoke a potential new truth. 
that he is the Messiah, and that she could receive the Messiah. So he spoke the current truth and a potential new truth and allowed her to choose. So none of this was about the future. You know, In 15 days, you will see a red car and you should buy it or something like that. That's actually not mostly what this is about. This is about speaking God's truth and life into a situation. Uh, often enough, it's helping you re-understand who you are or a situation you've been through, right? You see yourself like this, but God sees you like this. Or you understood the situation as a judgment, but actually it was training God wants, or you know, whatever the thing is, I'm just making up examples here. But the reality is, it's God wants to speak his truth over what we've already known or experienced. And actually the single biggest reason God might speak to you about someone else isn't even to share it. What? Yeah. It's actually not even to share it. It's to give you a prayer agenda for the other person. That's the most common reason God speaks to you. The reality is God wants us praying for each other and pouring into each other and building each other up. And so sometimes he'll say to you, you know, in your own prayer time, you know, so-and-so, they're having a hard time. This is kind of maybe a few, one or two pieces of what's going on in their life. And it's actually not about you to prophesy over them. It's actually about you to pray for them and to grab a new prayer heart and a new prayer agenda and to support them and help them birth these things. In fact, in fact I'm gonna say 90% of the prophetic words I've received in my entire life have really just been to pray for people. It's really simple. So if you're new to this and you're trying to like figure this stuff out, can I just recommend, by all means, receive every prophetic word you ever can and just pray them all. Just pray them all. It's all in God's hands anyways. You're not needing to make something happen or, or push. If it's God's power and Holy Spirit and timing, it's God's power, Holy Spirit and timing. It's not you. So just pray into it. Allow his spirit to birth it into it. So no, it's not mostly about the future. The last question I want to address is, how do you know it's God's and not your own voice. Man, I could talk about this for months. We're going to do a little flyover. You know, Jesus said, the sheep will follow him because they recognize his voice. And they will never follow a stranger, and instead they'll run from him because they don't recognize the voice of strangers. So for starters, if you want to know if it's God's voice or your own voice, a couple of real quick tests. Number one, does it contradict the Bible? Because it shouldn't. I think that's pretty standard, right? Nothing's going to contradict the Bible. So every now and then some kooky person comes along and believes they have some new dispensation of the word that something in the Bible is wrong or false or misunderstood. We just ignore that. That's not what we're talking about. So it doesn't contradict the Bible. Number two, this is a simple one. Does it build up, cheer up, cheer up or stir up? Is it depressing? Is it tearing someone down? Is it negative? Is it dark? Is it disturbing? That's not from God. We leave that be. Does it build up, cheer up, or steer up? If I have a word for somebody, let's say, that's like, oh man, God sees you as a mighty warrior, and even though you're small, he sees you as powerful, and he wants to support you, great, woo! If I have a word for somebody, he's like, you're a terrible person, and God hates you. Okay, that's not prophetic. That's just being mean. Simple enough. Is in agreement with others. You know, if you're wondering, if this is new to you, and this is kind of freaking you out a little bit, don't worry. We're going to be unpacking this for a while. I really encourage you to come to that course on Saturday. But the reality is, you don't have to go around just because you've given a word and like tell everybody. We should be in agreement with each other. So one of the great things about this is if there's one spirit giving one word, then we should all be in agreement on it. And so we can share this, and we can talk about this, and we can hone it, and then we can get a stronger prayer agenda for it because we recognize that, that maybe two or three or four or five of us are in agreement about this, and then we can pray into it with more confidence. It's not about manipulating people. This is about bringing life and fruit and abundance. Um, but the last point I want to make about that is, how do you know it's God's voice and not your own? Practice and focus. There's really no short steps. I think sometimes if you're freaked out about prophecy, you go, oh, I don't want any of this stuff. Or if you're overexcited about it, you're like, I want all of this stuff. And both of those things won't help you at all, actually. Both of those, those sort of viewpoints won't help you at all. Running away from it, and Paul says, I wish you all would. It would be good for you. This is a powerful tool and weapon against darkness and to build up and cheer up and stir up. But just wanting it doesn't do anything. And, and when, when I was working through this stuff, the, the, the image God gave to me was if you're playing baseball... Some of you love baseball. And you're on first base, right? You've hit a single and you're on first base. As the runner on first base, you watch the third base coach. And that coach is about as far away from you as he can be. Way out over by third base. And he'll tell you if you should run or stop or stay or steal. All of those things. 
Now, I was a short kid. I know, it's hard to imagine. And so when I was playing baseball, if I just bent over, there was almost no strike zone. So I was the king of getting walked, which means I was the king of getting to first base. And then what? Right? You're waiting for things to happen. You've got to watch the third base coach, and I stole a lot of bases. In fact, when I was playing in, in Little League, I had the most bases stolen of anybody because I was fast and I watched that third base coach. How do you do that? Well, you practice and you focus. There's nothing else to it, right? You can't be watching the birds flying by. You can't be listening to the parents cheering and jeering in the stands. You can't be listening to the banter between the first baseman and the pitcher. There's all of these distractions going on, but a good runner just watches the third base coach. Do you, do you see what I'm saying here? Do you understand what I'm saying? See, if you're focused entirely on your job, or on your family, or on your busyness, or how tired you are, or whatever, on your hobbies, if you're not actually ever focused on Jesus, no, how would you ever know it's his voice and not yours? You, you won't. You simply won't. This is where time spent on reading God's word. This is where time spent hearing God for yourself, right? What does God want to say to you? Is he convicting you of something? Is he wrestling with you with something? Does he want to share some amazing, you know, joy or insight to you about yourself? As you learn to hear for yourself, you're going to learn to hear that shepherd's voice. And so there's no shortcut. Take time. Take time and be focused. That's all there is to it. And then you can grow as God wants you to grow. It's simple enough. Close to nine years ago, Destiny and I were living in the city in Winnipeg. We had a house. We'd felt both independently strongly convicted that we should consider selling our house, paying off all of our debt, being completely debt-free. But we knew this meant renting, and we already owned a house. And on paper, we were double income, no kids. And on paper, we were doing fine financially, but we felt the, the stress. We felt like God was really convicting us to be selling our house and to be living debt-free. And we wanted to have a child. We badly wanted to have a child. And I've talked about this before. We were both separately infertile, and that doesn't work well together either, so we didn't have children. And we were talking about moving back to Rolls-Nord area, which both of us were really kind of like freaked out about this whole idea of moving back to where we came from, right? Because when you come from a small town, right, moving to the city and making it in Winnipeg is like the big thing, I guess. I don't know. I don't see it that way anymore. But when I was younger, I did. And so we were wrestling with all of these things. And, and we, we felt, me and Des both felt like we should sell our place, that we'd have a child, that we should move back to where our parents, you know, the general area where our parents came for this season, and that I should get a new job. But we were wrestling. That's a lot of life choice, just to like poof. I mean, I got a high tolerance for risk. That's a lot going on. I went to Church of the Rock for, I don't remember what, I think a Saturday evening Easter service or something. I can't remember exactly what it was. Keith Eberhard there, he's their, their uh, prophetic pastor. He was standing right by where you take communion. I think it was communion for Easter. And as I walked by, he just looked at us and said to me something about, I just really want to congratulate you on your new job. I didn't have a new job. And then he quoted Deuteronomy. He quoted Deuteronomy 28, 11 to 12 to me. There's no slide for this, by the way. I want to read it to you. And I want you to imagine you're in my shoes. We're thinking about making these big life choices. And all of a sudden, a guy out of the blue just put his hand on my shoulder, looked me in the eye, smiled, and he said, and the Lord will make you abound in prosperity in the fruit of your womb and in the fruit of your livestock and in the fruit of the ground within the land that the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. The Lord will open to you his good treasury, the heavens, to give you the rain and the land and the season and to bless all the works of your hands. And you shall lend to many nations, but you shall borrow from none. God's going to give you the fruit of the womb. You're going to return to the land of your forefathers. He will bless you. You should not be borrowing, but you can lend. Right there. It's two verses. You want to talk about prophetic confirmation. By the end of that year, we lived about two and a half miles from where Dest grew up. We had no debt, and we had Hannah. It's pretty awesome. And, and then God blessed me very richly with a wonderful job so that we could be single income and Des could be a stay-at-home mom and, and raise our kids, which we could not have done before with where I was working. And then on top of that, God brought, and this actually was one of the biggest blessings, and this is going to sound weird, and I'm not trying to brag here. I'm just trying to be honest because I feel like this is part of the prophetic word. God brought us a whole bunch of people, friends and family close to us who were in need 
exactly the times that God was re- blessing us richly financially so that we were actually not even, not even just able to lend, but be able to give money and help and aid away to those around us. That was one of the best parts about God blessing you is that you get to bless others with it. And we haven't always been. In fact, most of my married life, we've been in school or single income or whatever, and it's been hard to be able to bless those around us sometimes. And God just blessed us richly for a season where we could bless those around us. And that was all contained right there in one beautiful prophetic word. It was awesome. It just spoke into our hearts. So that's the power of prophecy. Now, like I said, Questions, concerns, thoughts, feedback? Email them, text, whatever. I would love to know and be able to address them. And I would encourage you, if you are having any reaction right now, right? if you're sitting there going, well, this was boring, then fine, it was boring, I'm sorry, go home, it's okay. But if you are either bothered, worried, concerned, confused, excited, interested, something you've participated in and want to go further in or whatever, come to the course on Saturday and just witness and learn and soak and take some steps of faith and see. I want to really encourage you on that. I'd love to see you all out there. Uh, We've got lots of room. I'm going to say we have lots of room. I actually don't know if that's true, but we're not going to turn anybody away. Diane Harrison is fantastic. She came with me to Uganda, or I came with her, I guess, to Uganda last year. Uh, It was great working with her. Now, I want to do something interesting right now. I was thinking about challenges. I like to give challenges at the end of a message. But this felt like a weird message to give a challenge on. And so we're going to do something a little bit different this morning. And what Karen and I are going to do is we're just going to do a little bit of time of prophetic and, and demonstration. I don't know what God's going to do. Because if I knew what God was going to do, it would be me and not God, right? Amen? Amen? And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to have a prayer here, simple prayer. And then if you would like to just be part of this witness, watch this, I, I don't want, what I don't want you to take away from this is, oh, well, the pastors can prophesy and we just receive or something like that. This is for actually for all of us, but I want to give just some, some basic examples of how this could work. And the best way I could think to do it is, you know what? We're just going to prophesy and pray over some people and cheer up and build up and stir up. Amen? Do I got your permission for that? Amen. Fantastic. So if you want to bow your heads with me right now, Lord God, we thank you for your words strongly confirmed to each one of us in your Bible. And we ask right now as well that you would just minister to each one of us, even those of us who don't receive any prophetic words today. That doesn't matter. Your spirit can pour over us and into us and speak into us. And so we ask that your spirit does. And I just pray right now for doubting hearts to be shored up, for confused hearts to be built up, and for weary hearts to be cheered up. Lord God, that your prophetic word would speak life and hope and the ministry of all believers. We pray this in your precious name, and everybody said, amen.